Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Drauss and I am a professor of sociology at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. And I'm here to talk to you today about chapter eight from Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is focused on the issue of behavior. So here is a picture of Mr. Kendi, and here's a cover of the not yet released paperback version of his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. This book was a brisk and invigorating read for me, and I appreciated how he wove his personal story into each chapter of the book, charting a kind of course in terms of the evolution of his own thinking, which is offered as a kind of a model, both negative and positive, that we may choose to follow. I'm a few years older than Kendi, and as you may guess, I am not black, or I'm not defined as black in the United States. But my own experiences and mental evolution parallel his in some interesting ways. Kendi talks about the error that he made as a young man of confusing individual behaviors with group level characteristics. The mistake is also made by white politicians, such as President Bill Clinton, and by prominent black leaders, such as Jesse Jackson, both of whom are quoted in the book. This error occurs when we lazily rely on assertions about quote unquote black culture, the subject of the previous chapter in the book, or quote unquote black behavior, the subject of this chapter. So according to Kendi, racial group behavior is a figment of the racist's imagination. Individual behavior can shape the success of individuals, but policies determine the success of groups. And it is racist power that creates the policies that cause race inequities. So in that short passage, there's really a lot for us to think about. And so I started thinking about in terms of, as I mentioned, my own thinking as it has evolved over time. I don't think I ever firmly believed in racial group behavior in the kind of pure sense that Kendi is talking about here. I grew up in a predominantly white environment and I saw too many apparently white screw ups around me to think that there was anything uniformly virtuous about them. There were very few, if any, African Americans in the community where I grew up, at least not living in the community, and I didn't know enough black people to make inferences about them as a group. Uh, and this is not uncommon uh, as an experience in the United States, which is a very segregated country in many ways. Thankfully, my parents never employed racial stereotypes of any kind, though some of my other relatives certainly did. My parents were non-racist, but they were not actively anti-racist, except in those moments when they argued with the other relatives, calling them out on their prejudices. Mostly, they just didn't talk about race. And of course, this is one of the things that Kendi discusses in his book, the difference between being a non-racist and being an anti-racist. And of course, in his view, being a non-racist is in fact enabling racist power to persist. But of course, because I was growing up in this context where racist thinking is so prevalent, I was still susceptible to racist thinking. A common example of such thinking quite prevalent in the 1980s and 1990s, especially in the Chicago area where I grew up, was this idea or myth of the culture of poverty. And here I, I'm giving you uh, an example which really sticks in my mind from the, from the 1990s. It was a book called The American Millstone, which actually originally appeared as a series of stories in the Chicago Tribune. In the culture of poverty myth, uh, the concentration of poor black people in central cities and the behaviors that they seem to exhibit, such as substance use, crime, prostitution, and so on, uh, often served as a kind of prima facie evidence for the moral degradation of the group as a whole or the culture of the group. Uh, and this, of course, is a classic racist trope. Later in my life, when I worked in some of those same inner cities, I saw how this mistake could be made. For example, in Detroit, uh, we know that as soon as you cross a border from one 
part of our region to another, and this shows a border between Detroit and Gross Point Park, um, there's often a very visible difference in the environment and in the behaviors that you may see. In Chicago, where I was working in the 1990s, this was also the case. And if you cross the boundary from a quote unquote white neighborhood to a quote unquote black neighborhood in Chicago, you might very well notice a difference that was visible. More people standing around on street corners, for example. And these were uh, some individuals on the west side of Chicago, many of whom I, I got to know in the time that I worked there. And this was a very typical scene in uh, neighborhoods like the west side of Chicago, where outdoor spaces such as this would serve as social gathering places. And if you were, and this is a, a picture taken from the window of my car, and it's something that you might see driving in your car through a neighborhood which you saw as a quote unquote, a black neighborhood. And so you can start to see how if certain types of behavior are visible and a, a certain group is more visible in that area, we can make the mental error of associating behaviors with groups. When my son was very young and we were living here in Detroit, I used to take him along on a lot of visits to different communities in the city of Detroit. When he was around five years old, he started making observations about race, unprompted observations. Why does it look like this in Detroit? He would ask me as we drove in the car through different neighborhoods in Detroit. And I asked him, I was curious, how do you know we are in Detroit? And he would say, because the people have dark brown skin. And he had started to make the association when we were passing from Dearborn, where we were living, to Detroit, that there was a difference in the way people look. And then I asked him, and what's different about how the place looks in this place where there are more people with dark brown skin? And he said something like, the sidewalks are all cracked. You know, it's junky looking. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said. I was driving a car at the time and it was a long time ago, but it struck me then and it sticks with me today that this was a rather profound comment on how racialized our environment is, lending itself quite conveniently to racist thinking in a kind of a repetitive cycle that reinforces itself over time. Later, I came to see those behaviors that I was seeing and that other people would see visible in these neighborhoods as actually rather logical, if kind of self-limiting responses to a harsh and unforgiving environment that individuals were making. For example, if you are poor and selling drugs offers an opportunity to make some money, that may very well be a logical choice for you, even though it may be likely also to land you in prison eventually or to endanger your own life. Going even further, and this is when I started studying sociology during this time when I was working in these neighborhoods on the west side of Chicago. If you looked at how the neighborhood got to be that way, who was able to live where in the segregated city, and what contributed to the growth of the prison system into which so many people were being sucked during this period of time in the 1990s when the prison system was expanding exponentially, you started to notice a different set of unseen actors in the drama. It was then that you could see racist power. And this is just a slide illustrating a street corner in Chicago where we, you would often see people congregating outside. And again, if you viewed this only from the outside, you might associate this as a kind of a, a, a characteristic of the group that happened to be represented in that neighborhood. Um, and over time, I came to recognize the corner as being a, a very important social place and the people were drawn there for very particular reasons. In other words, that it met some of their needs uh, that they were seeking to address at the time. So after spending almost 10 years working in these inner city environments, I took a job doing research on substance abuse in small towns in Ohio. I was interested in understanding more about the more prevalent but less discussed issues facing poor rural residents. I gave a presentation around 2003 at the White Privilege Conference held in Pella, Iowa with the title, White Lines, Black Crack, 
where I examined the association of different substances with different racial groups, specifically the idea that crack cocaine was a quote, black drug. I had seen for myself that white people liked smoking crack as much as black people did, and national statistics backed this up. In fact, at this time, rates among non-metropolitan drug users were going up, and rates among black folks were going down. Now, drug researchers are well aware of the fact that African Americans in general use illicit drugs at a lower rate than white folks do. But you might never know this from representations in media, which reinforce the idea that drugs are an inner city and urban and therefore a black problem. By showing the reality of white crack use, I was trying in my small way to confront this racist myth. And these are images uh, from uh, the film New Jack City, which came out in the early 1990s. Um, and with Chris Rock in one of his first major roles, which he may at this point regret, uh, playing a, uh, an individual with the problem of crack cocaine dependency. When this image really essentially helped to reinforce a certain kind of stereotype. But there are other reasons for that stereotype or that association as well. Some of you may be familiar with the song, The Ten Crack Commandments uh, by a Notorious B.I.G. or AKA Biggie Smalls. And this was a song that came out in 1997. And this is a picture of uh, Biggie Smalls holding the Ten Crack Commandments. I'll see if we can hear a part of the song. Grammarly does more than catch errors. After this ad from Grammarly. With Grammarly, you can find really good. No. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, it's the ten crack commandments. Five. One, two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, three, four. Nick, can't tell me nothing about this car. Uh, can't tell me nothing about this crack. This weed and my hustle and niggas. Niggas on the corner. I ain't forget you, niggas. My triple B, niggas. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've been in this game for years. Uh, it may be an animal. It's rules for this shit. I wrote me a manual, a step by step booklet for you to get your game on track. Got your wig pushed back. Rule number uno. Never let no one know how much dough you hold. Cause you know, the cheddar breed jealousy, especially if that man fucked up. Get your ass stuck. Hold on a second. Never let them know your next move. Don't you know bad boys do with silence and violence? Take it from your eyes. Uh -huh. I okay, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the Ten Crack Commandments by Notorious B.I.G. And I also, if you saw there, I put up a few slides of some of the towns that I did research in in the early 2000s. These are towns in uh, Ohio, in central, um, central Ohio which might often be seen as a, uh, from the outside, again, as a kind of a, a picture postcard environment. But if you went and looked below the surface, and you didn't have to look very long, you could see in the newspapers that there actually was a, a, a crack cocaine problem or a crack cocaine market, you might can look at it in different ways, that was very, very active in these communities. So we wrote a couple of papers, several papers, uh, chronicling uh, this issue uh, of crack cocaine use in rural Ohio. Um, these are just some examples of the articles that we published. And again, this was sort of my attempt to confront this myth of the idea that drugs uh, of any kind are associated more with one group or particularly with one group as opposed to another group. Now, Kendi also discusses standardized tests at some length, and I'm sure a lot of you have had experience with those. And he uses this as an illustration of what social scientists call the attribution um, effect. We tend to employ it selectively. If I, as a young white man, score well on a test, it is an accurate measure of my individual intelligence. And if I score poorly, it's because I wasn't adequately prepared. But if a young black man scores poorly, it may very likely be attributed, consciously un or unconsciously, by others or by himself to his so-called race. So for example, and this is a chart just showing you, 
race gaps and SAT scores for math. And actually you can see here that African-Americans who are represented or black folks who are represented in dark blue, their scores uh, are, are consistently on the low end. White folks are sort of uh, on average higher with Asian folks actually having on average the highest scores. Now, when a white individual does poorly on a test, we may attribute it to many things, but we usually do not attribute it to the fact that that individual is white. But we make exactly the opposite assumption oftentimes, according to Kendi, when the individual is black, there's an attribution back to the group level. Of course, this may miss the other factors that are at work, for example, and this is uh, the, the role of socioeconomics and educational preparation. And as Kendi discusses, the fact that those who have more economic means are able to find the resources to prepare themselves precisely to succeed on standardized tests. And so this slide shows us that um, economically disadvantaged students are much more, uh, African Americans are much more likely percentage wise to be economically disadvantaged. And this then results in, a, a, again, a kind of a persistent cycle where some groups, because of their positioning, um, which is a result in Kendi's view of policies at work, consistently do better on standardized tests while other groups are consistently disadvantaged in standardized tests. Now, I'm gonna go back to the subject of drug use because we are seeing another example today of this attribution error. Uh, and here I'm talking about the current opioid crisis, which is seen by many as a white issue. And here is just an image, the first image that came up when I put in uh, opioid users into a, a, a search on my computer on the, on the, on the internet. In fact, of course, there are black opioid users as well as white ones, and I've met many of them also doing other research on substance use in Detroit. Some have observed that opioid users who are often coded in our imagination and in the media as white are less likely to be arrested, incarcerated, and viewed as bad people, and more likely to be seen as sick or needing help. This creates, um, if this is the case, then what we are seeing once again is the presence of racist power, creating and enforcing policies that benefit one group while excluding another, not because of differences in behavior, but because of a societal attribution error. To be a little more precise, racist power enacts policies that enable its power to be preserved. It is a social attribution error, that is the error that the rest of us in the population make, that allows this power to be unquestioned. And this is just an abstract from a recent article looking at the war on drugs and this idea of wasted whiteness. Now, actually, we used to hear this expression occasionally when doing research in, um, on rural substance use in settings in Ohio and then later in uh, Kentucky and in Arkansas. And the expression is that if you're a white person and you screw up by using drugs, that in fact you're wasting your whiteness, that it's a waste of white. And I heard this expression used before. Um, what this article discusses is how um, the racialized deployment of the war on drugs is sustained by the lack of explicit discussion of race in the service of a colorblind ideology. So in other words, when we're not talking about race, being non-racist, we're in fact diverting our attention from the fact that racism is very much operating through these policies. And in this case, the major policy is, um, is the so-called war on drugs, the policy orientation of the United States government, which disproportionately impacted African-Americans, even though the evidence was very clear that white Americans and African-Americans use drugs in um, the same rates, or in fact, that African-Americans use drugs illicit drugs at lower rates than did white Americans. So to conclude, I think we owe Ibram Kendi a word of thanks for calling out the various ways that racism invades our thinking. Uh, as he puts it, uh, as long as the mind thinks there's something behavior, behaviorally, behaviorally wrong with a racial group, the mind can never be anti-racist. As long as the mind is racist, the mind can never be free. 
And he continues to say that to be anti-racist is to de-racialize behavior, to remove the tattooed stereotype from every racialized body. Again, that includes white bodies as well as black bodies. Behavior is something that humans, not races, do. So although Kendi's book is deliberately written as a kind of a how-to manual, it does not tell us exactly what to do. And I think we, we should thank Kendi for calling out the various ways, again, that racism invades our thinking and for not excluding himself from this thorough analysis. The book doesn't tell us exactly what to do, but it does challenge us to think about the ways in which we think about race and to direct our anger and our actions where they belong towards the racist policy of policies that ultimately limit us all. So that's the conclusion of my commentary on chapter eight of how to be an anti-racist. And thank you very much for your attention.